who is a PhD candidate at the Department of Earth, Environmental and Planetary Sciences at Brown University. And he'll be speaking to us about impact cratering today. So go ahead, Evan, take it away. All right, uh, thanks for that introduction. Um, as you said, my name is Evan Bionis, and uh, just a little bit about me before we get started. I'm originally from New Jersey. Um, I went to high school there, and then I went to Rutgers for my bachelor's. Then I decided to go to Minnesota for a master's in planetary science. And um, then I, I did a uh, short time in Houston, working in the oil and gas industry, before I decided to go back to school and study impact cratering as a profession um, now at Brown University. Also, a little bit more fun stuff. I am a pet parent to a very adorable little dog in this picture named Mr. Pib, as well as a very large cat named Tater Tot. And um, since I've been at Brown, I've been able to learn how to use computers to understand how impact craters are forming on different planets and moons all across our solar system. Even though I am currently using mainly computer methods to do my research. I am also a geologist at heart. And I would just like to point out that I have a favorite mineral, like most geologists do. And mine is called Celestine. And I think, I don't know, it really encompasses how I feel about space, I think, because it's a nice blue color. It's got like lighter shades, darker shades. I feel like it has a lot of depth to it. So um, beautiful little mineral, check it out. It's pretty awesome. Um, so yeah. Although um, the topic of this presentation is impact cratering, I did want to take some time and kind of back up a little bit and first talk about meteorites. Um, meteorites are basically how space materials are coming to Earth and how we can find them. So in this GIF, it's just your typical shooting star animation. And this is how I think most people think about meteorites and shooting stars. It's just these ethereal kind of distant events where you, you see this bright light shooting across the sky, but what actually is the meteorite? Uh, we can back up even further and, and think about what specifically it is about our Earth that causes this kind of look to meteorites, and it's actually because of our atmosphere. So a meteorite is a space rock that's coming through and gets kind of captured by Earth's gravitational field. And then as it hits our atmosphere and comes to our surface, it's going to collide with all these little air molecules that are in our atmosphere and all those little collisions, especially as it gets closer to the surface where there's even uh, more and more molecules. All those little collisions are actually going to burn up the outside of the meteorite and it gives um, these meteorites that we can find on the surface of the earth a very interesting and distinctive look shown in this image. So if you find if you're lucky enough to find an actual meteorite. It's often going to have that like reddish brown kind of rusty color on the outside, it's going to have a lot of those pits. And um, I, don't, I hope you can see my mouse, but you, you're going to get like a lot of these like shell shaped structures. And all of that is because as this rock is flying through our atmosphere at kilometers per second, um, it's going to burn up and pieces of it are going to fly off and it's going to like kind of break up a little bit. And all of those kind of features are very distinctive for rocks that have come from outer space. And that's a good, um, quick and, and easy way to see if it's, it's, it's a brown rock, but it has like nice kind of um, rigid structure, or if it's kind of wavy like this, if is it, is it an earth rock or is it a meteorite? We can also break open the meteorites to try to see what's inside them. And if we can do that using laboratory techniques, we can get a little bit more information about where the rock actually comes from. So um, a lot of meteorites come from the asteroid belt, which is between uh, Mars and Jupiter. And there are lots of rocks in that space that are of different sizes. And how big it is is going to depend, or it's going to determine, it's going to help you figure out how much of this process called differentiation the rock has gone through. And differentiation is a really big word but basically all it boils down to is how much were your lighter elements able to separate from your heavier elements. So you can think of it, if you take a glass of water and you pour some olive oil in it and you stir it up, it's gonna mix the oil and the water. But then if you let it sit for a little while, the oil and the water are gonna separate. So planets and moons will do the same thing where you get, if it's not very big, 
your heavier stuff and your lighter stuff will stay together. But as it gets larger and larger, so moving to the right in this image, then your heavier stuff will get to sink to the bottom, which is the center of the planet, and your lighter stuff will get to separate to the top. So it's exactly the same way of like your salad dressing, your oil and your water separating. If then you take one of these relatively large asteroids or planetoids, as we might call them, and you smash it and you eject a piece of the surface and it gets to come to Earth as a meteorite, we can then break it open and potentially see where it came from in our solar system. Uh, I just wanted to show you um, a few images of the inside of meteorites. These are special cases, they're not the norm. The norm is pretty much a blackish looking rock that's kind of nondescript. So it doesn't have a whole lot of defining features, but um, what I think some of the most beautiful meteorites that we have have these really distinctive kind of look to them. So the first one I'm gonna show you is called the Widman-Staten pattern. It's hard to pronounce a little bit. And this is really interesting because this kind of plaid looking texture, as we would call it, inside the rock, both the light and the dark parts are both metals. So it's a nickel and an iron combination, which are both metals that are found in Earth's core as well. So they're not like super special in that way. But the way that they coexist in this plaid pattern is very distinctive of meteorites. So if you're able to open up a rock that you think is a meteorite and you see this crosshatch of two different metals, kind of coexisting, then you know this is a meteorite. And not only that, but if we go back to this image, I believe it's a meteorite of like this kind of size of parent body. So that's where it would come from. And that's really interesting and diagnostic. And then we're able to take a rock like that and go into the lab and kind of do more tests on it to see just exactly where it came from, how it evolved um, chemically, and all those kinds of things. Then um, if we go into even more interesting looking kinds of rocks, this is my favorite kind of rock. I showed you my favorite mineral earlier. It's my favorite rock. It's called a palisite. And a palisite is also definitely a meteorite because you get these lighter yellowish green crystals, as we would call them, inside this metal combination, this metal texture in between. And if you get a rock like this, then you know that the parent body, so whatever asteroid it came from originally, you know that that, that asteroid was large enough to go through that, that separation that I talked about earlier, where you've got your metal sinking to the inside and you've got your lighter, um, these yellowish crystals inside the metal part here are trying to rise up to the surface. And this is also a pattern that you would only see in meteorites. Um, you don't get to see stuff like this in any kind of earth rock. So it's also very diagnostic and very interesting. Um, there's a lot of work ongoing about how palisites form. And do you need like an early kind of asteroid that's like relatively young in its age, or does it have to be an older kind of asteroid? So this is a hot topic of research and very interesting as well. So now that I've talked to you a little bit about meteorites, we're gonna get into the actual, uh, what you came here for, which is impact craters. And Impact craters form when you get objects that are hitting at a very high speed. Um, I have this image here of a baseball hitting a baseball bat. And although this is an impact in a very traditional sense, and you can see the baseball is deforming as it hits the bat, which means that it's just changing its shape in response to the two things hitting each other. Um, this would be a similar process of like bumper cars. If you go to play bumper cars, whenever we get to go back outside, um, but what makes this different than the impact processes that me and other researchers study is that this is not nearly fast enough. So you can think of how fast cars drive, you know, maybe 60 miles an hour, 70 miles an hour, how fast airplanes will fly. I guess I don't really know how fast airplanes fly, maybe hundreds of miles an hour. But impact cratering is like 100 times faster than that. So this is a very, very high speeds. We can replicate it in a lab, but it has to be under very specific conditions, which is why um, what I do using computers to study these processes is really powerful because you don't actually have to have a whole lab set up 
you don't have to get a very high powered air gun to shoot sand particles at a piece of metal. We can run it all on computers and kind of like save that space and um, be able to investigate very large problems. Um, impact craters, depending on the size of the projectile, can be um, very different sizes as well. So I'm just going to go through a little bit of the size progression. And the smallest impact craters that we kind of see are called micro impacts. And this is when you get very, very small particles. So the, the speed or the piece coming from space would be no more than a centimeter in diameter, so a centimeter across. And that's actually going to be on the very large end of a micro impact. And these fall to the earth all the time as well. But because they're so small, they very rarely do any damage. But I was able to find this image of a solar panel that had been hit by a micrometeorite. And even though this particle was probably, I don't know, half a centimeter across, if that, probably even smaller, you can see it, it very well destroyed the solar panel. <laughs> and uh, it's great. You, this is the point of impact here where you get the most damage. And then the far, farther away you get, you're still seeing damage, but it's at a much smaller scale. Um, so even though these, these are falling to earth all the time, but they don't cause a lot of, uh, a lot of injury or anything, they can hurt some earth objects. But what's really notable about these, um, these impacts is that they're very important to consider when we think about our astronauts and our space program. So if you have an astronaut up in the space station or doing a spacewalk in their spacesuit, and they get hit with one of these micrometeorites, there's a good chance that it's going to blow right through their suit and potentially cause a catastrophic problem and that that astronaut could be in very serious trouble of not making it back to Earth. So NASA and the European Space Agency have done a lot of work um, trying to understand how we can best protect our astronauts against these micro impacts, even though on Earth they're not very important. If we go now a little bit bigger into what we might consider our traditional impact craters that we see. The smallest version of this is called a simple crater, where you have a relatively, relatively small rock that comes in and hits the earth and causes a, a nice smooth kind of bowl-shaped depression. Um, I was able to grab some of my research and make a movie for you of how this forms. So what I'm going to show you is a movie of a simple crater forming, and this uh, circle in the center is the impactor, so it's coming down and hitting the surface. And when I play the movie, you'll see the crater opening up and then kind of settling down. And it's pretty interesting. So here it opens up. And then as part of that settling down, that didn't really work. As part of that settling down, then the bottom is going to rise up and the ejecta, which is the part that's ejected from the sides, is going to settle and fall to the sides. And this is just your very basic simple crater. Um, this image that I showed earlier is from Meteor Crater in Arizona, and it's probably the best known example of this kind of crater, at least in the United States. And even though it's three quarters of a mile across, which may not mean a whole lot, um, especially to kids, but it would take you 15 minutes to walk across at a pretty good speed, um, even though it's that big, the meteorite that caused it was only the size of a school bus. So this is a pretty good example of showing how a, a relatively small rock can cause a really large feature. And in this image, uh, this black bit at the bottom is the visitor center, or maybe that's the parking lot actually. And then this is the visitor center. So that's another scale to think about how big this feature is. Uh, Meteor Crater has been great for research because um, it's well preserved, it's in the desert, so there's no water that's going to come and try to erode it more quickly and get rid of it. And also, uh, scientists are able to look at the beds that are along the side of the walls to see um, how the rocks underneath the surface were deformed and how they were um, behaving, all the different stresses that were going on. The next size of craters that are a little bit bigger are called complex craters. And complex craters are defined by this uplifted peak in the center. So this is just an image of a crater called Tycho that's on the moon. 
And Tyco is great because we get this nice, uh, pretty well-defined rim around the outside. It has a relatively flat floor, which is also typical of complex craters. It's more flat on the bottom than a simple crater. And you also get this uplifted peak. So it's like a little mini mountain right in the center. And a way to think of it is if you take a raindrop and you drop it in a bucket or a puddle, it's exactly the same process. So here we've dropped that raindrop and then it comes back up and you get that little mountain right in the center. It's exactly the same process. Um, actually, this is just a little fun fact. The kind of code, the kind of computer model that I use to do my research is called the hydro code. And it uses that prefix hydro for water because at these very high speeds, the rocks that are deforming are acting like water and they're acting like a fluid. If we then go even larger, <clears throat> we get these features called peak ring craters. And a peak ring crater forms exactly the same way as a complex crater, except that this time, since it's even bigger, when you get that little mountain form in the center, it is also too large for how big the rock is, and then that will fall down and settle. So I was able to make another movie for you guys about a peak ring crater. It's set up exactly the same, where the ball in the center is your impactor, and it's going to collide with the target. And then we're going to see the crater open up. But this time, instead of just settling, we're going to see it um, come back to the center, form a nice peak in the middle, and then collapse back down. So it opens, comes back up, you get this really nice whole rebound effect, and then that will settle down as well. And when this is done, because that, that inner mountain was so large and it fell back down, um, it pushes that material out to the side, which forms the material for that peak ring. And although it, it may not look like a very large elevation difference in, in uh, this view, but the little bit that is different is detectable by uh, techniques that scientists will use on other bodies to try to get the topography, which is just like the height of the different rocks. So it may not look like it's a very big ring of mountains, but it's actually like well, well able to be uh, detected. Then the largest kind of impact crater that we see is called the multi-ring basin. So it's called a basin just because it is so big. Um, a basin is just a really big area of a, of a depression. So that would be like the whole cratering event was so large that it caused a big hole in the ground, really, really big. Um, this is Oriental Basin on the moon. And Oriental is visible to the naked eye if you look at the moon, but it's kind of on the side. So it'd be hard to see with your naked eye, like the full vision of it. So this is another image of the moon from one of our orbiters. And the color on the right-hand side is just your topography. So that's the height of the rocks. The blue part is lower than the red part, and the yellow and green are kind of intermediate in, in the middle. And a multi-ring basin is really interesting and important. It's actually what I study for my research because um, the impact event, so the, the asteroid that's coming in and hitting the surface is so large and it's causing so much devastation that not only is it forming the crater in the center like we normally would think of it, but it's also causing lots and lots of rock deformation, rock breaking very far away from the point of impact. So studying multi-ring basins is a way to understand really how the whole system of the planet or the moon is trying to work together. It's actually a very powerful tool, but because these basins are so, so large, um, it can be difficult to actually get the models to run. Um, so I'll just quick get into some ongoing questions that I could think of regarding impact cratering. And um, the first one I've kind of hinted at already is how do these really large basins form? And this can refer to multi-ring basins like I study. It can also refer to peak ring basins. Um, when you get craters that are this large, depending on what planet or moon they form on, you can uh, see some deformation from the rock layers that are underneath the surface. And we can try to tease out what's going on in those really deep layers by looking at 
how the crater is forming and other techniques that we have available to us to try to get a feel for the whole system as, a, as an entire planet or an entire moon. Uh, we also do work trying to investigate what kind of material will affect the impact. So material in this sense is just what kind of rock, how cold is it, how hot is it, does it have water in it? These are all really important geologic questions that will all have a, a, a very large effect on how these basins will form. What is also really interesting, and, and I've learned a lot since I have gone back to school for this, is that impact craters will also form on bodies that are covered in ice. So I do a lot of work on Jupiter's moons, like Europa, which is also covered in ice. And at the temperatures that we see there, the temperatures are so, so cold because it's so far away from our sun that the, the ice, even though on Earth you think like, oh, ice is kind of weak, I can break it with my teeth. At these very, very cold temperatures, ice behaves like a rock. So you can't break a rock with your teeth. Um, but so yeah, <laughs> if you if you impact the ice when it's that cold, you can also see a lot of really interesting cratering features. And then um, finally, we are trying to figure out how these impact craters will evolve through time. So once you form a crater, then what happens to it? Is it uh, further affected by, like say it's on the moon, is it further affected by the tides that we see with the moon? Or if it is made of ice, does it go away more quickly than if it were made of rock? And we can use impact cratering studies to kind of try to investigate those types of questions as well. And then the answers that we would find from those questions, we can then extrapolate into further, more broad geologic evolution questions. So like, how does the moon change overall through time, given how we see this one crater change as well. That's pretty interesting. Um, something that we all think about is why would we care about studying impact craters? I think aside from the question of dinosaur extinction, maybe there's not a whole lot of thought put into impact craters, but it's important to remember that we only have one solar system. We all live on Earth. We've gone to the moon, but not in a very long time. So we have very few tangible data points to understand how Earth has evolved, how Venus has evolved, how the moon has evolved. And we can use impact craters on these different planets and moons to try to understand how the system as a whole has evolved. How has it changed through time? Um, this goes into questions of how often do planets and moons get hit with asteroids? How often do planets and moons get like a large amount of new material from these impacts that then gets incorporated into its overall geologic system. These are all questions that can be answered using impact craters um, in different ways. And then and just specifically looking at Earth, this is a pretty Earth-based idea, is that although, as I said, impacts really you only think about it a whole lot for the dinosaurs, but impacts have affected many different parts of geological evolution. Uh, there's a couple ideas that many of the great extinctions, not just the dinosaurs, have been related to impacts. There's also um, the question of, in er early in Earth's history, how many impacts from cometary materials, which have a higher, a higher amount of ice in them, how much of those were able to bring water to Earth? Is that why Earth has so much water? And by looking at those questions and the solar system as a whole, we can kind of try to tease out how the whole thing evolved, not just Earth. And finally, I just wanted to kind of remind everyone that impact cratering, we normally think of it as a pretty ancient process that doesn't really affect our day-to-day -day life anymore, but impacts are still occurring. So I wanted to talk a little bit about two different airbursts that have happened since the 1900s. The first is the Tunguska event of 1908, and this was a relatively small asteroid or meteorite that came into the atmosphere. It was probably one fifth the size of a football field. And it came in over Russia and it, it was so small that it exploded in the atmosphere. And so this uh, asteroid was coming in, it started to burn up, like I talked about earlier, and it broke apart catastrophically. So just completely broke apart. And that caused a very large explosion over Russia that ended up destroying all the trees in this one area. Um, 
because it exploded so high up in the atmosphere, it didn't actually leave a crater, but it did kill all the trees in a really interesting way where it was just like a ring of downed trees that were all pointing away from the impact site. This was in 1908, so they didn't have a full understanding of what was really going on, but they did take this really interesting picture of all these trees that were downed. And then I was able to find a newer picture of the same event or the same area, I'm sorry. And even though it's been 112 years, the trees have still not come back to the Tunguska area after all that time. Uh, it was such a catastrophic shock event, so just really high temperatures and high pressures, that if you go to the area now, um, it's in the Siberian forest, so it'd be very difficult to get to. But if you were to go there, it's still just a plain field of grass because the trees have not come back yet. And then finally, um, there was another airburst event also in Russia that was in 2013. So that was only seven years ago. Uh, it's called the Chelyabinsk event. And Chelyabinsk was actually really well documented because it happened on a weekday during morning rush hour. So people were up and about, they were going to work, they were getting ready for school, they were just going to go about their day. And um, this is from a dash cam of a driver in Russia, and he's just driving down the road, and then in comes this fireball and lit up the sky brighter than the sun, and it was another airburst event that happened over a town. Um, it actually, it was larger than the Tunguska event, so it had a larger shockwave, it had a larger explosion, but I don't think that it had the tree effect that we saw in the other example. But what it did do is it injured about a thousand people because, as I mentioned, it was during the day, people were up and about, moving around, and it wasn't so much the, the shock itself of the, um, of the meteorite bursting apart, but instead it was the fact that that shockwave shattered a bunch of glass in the area and it broke a lot of walls and it knocked people over. So a lot of people were like slammed up against walls and slammed into broken glass and many people were injured. It was a pretty catastrophic thing that happened only seven years ago. And not to scare you too much, but there was no warning about this event because these, uh, these airbursts often occur with asteroids and meteorites that are less than a football field across. And there are so many of these, uh, these bodies in our solar system flying around Earth every day that NASA can't keep track of them. Like, we don't have the telescope power, we don't have the personnel, we don't have the people on the ground able to do the work to keep track of so many flying around asteroids that events like this are bound to happen even though we can't really predict them. But that being said, don't be scared. Space is a very big area, and we're not actually in a whole lot of danger at any given time of getting uh, getting hit with an asteroid. All right, so that's all I have for the presentation, and I guess I'll answer some questions. I'm gonna turn the screen off and answer some questions. All right. Um, so one question is, Keith from Hillsborough said about nine or 10 years ago, there was an impact in a suburban neighborhood in Bernard's, New Jersey. And, and or Keith, I'm sorry, Keith would like to know if it was an asteroid or if it was a meteorite impact. Um, I did a little bit of research in this ahead of time, and I actually do not think that this was an impact if I had to if I had to guess, just because the the news reports that I saw had it that there was a crater that had formed in this person's yard. There was like dirt strewn across, but um, there wasn't a whole lot of like noise associated, and it didn't seem to be round. So one thing about impact craters is that even though they're going to hit the surface at a variety of different angles, so like they could hit straight on, they could hit from the side, they could hit anywhere in between, only or 
most of those impacts are going to hit, um, or they're going to look as if they hit from straight down. So you're going to get a pretty um, round circular depression in the ground. And when I looked at this cratering event, this possible cratering event in this guy's front yard, it looked more uh, what we would say oblique. So it was like from the side. And I just, I don't think that that is likely to be an actual meteorite. Another thing that I noticed was that there was no reports of any sound. So like with the, the two airbursts that I mentioned, those were very loud events. And um, the, the guy who owned the house in this, in this question and his neighbors all said that there was no like distinctive noise that was going on. There was nothing really like that they could hear. So I, I would say that that's not likely to be a cratering event. That being said, I don't know what would cause just a random explosion of dirt. Um, but there was no noise. There was no meteorite recovered, which is not in itself a problem necessarily. But I just I would be surprised if that was actually an asteroid impact. Um, another question. I'm just trying to get a good mix of things here. Okay, Allison B wants to know if we're going to know in advance when an asteroid will hit us. And the answer to that is kind of complicated. Um, if it's large enough, we will know. But I think at this point, it's more likely that if we do get hit with something, it will be relatively small. And um, we won't have a lot of warning for that. But we also aren't likely to do that. So I, I put that in um, just as kind of like a, a reminder that these these impact processes are ongoing. And we we do need to kind of monitor the space, the world of the space that we live in um, in an existential like outer space kind of sense. But if we get hit with anything that's less than a football size, like football, football field sized across, um, it's probably not going to be as catastrophic as we would all think. So Earth, Earth as a planet, 70% of our surface is covered in water. So if you have an impact into water, that's going to um, be much less likely to impact any kind of human life or animal life. Um, and we have so much forest as well. So both of those airburst events that I mentioned happened in northern Russia. Um, Chelyabinsk happened to be near a small sized city, but there's just like a lot of uninhabited or sparsely inhabited forest across the earth. And I think the likelihood of us getting hit with something that actually like really would impact a large segment of the population is not super likely. Um, okay. Then Mary from Scotch Plains would like to know, oh, this is a good question. Do all impactors come in at the same speed? And the answer to that is no. They, they definitely will vary in their speed, but not as much as you might think. Um, to be considered an asteroid impact, the, the speed range is that it's probably, or not probably, it has to be traveling faster than what we would call Earth's escape velocity. And escape velocity is just how fast something needs to be traveling away from Earth to escape Earth's gravitational pull. And Earth's escape velocity is about 11 or 12 kilometers per second, which is very fast. Um, what is that in miles? So like, Eight miles per hour, eight miles per second, I would say approximately. Um, so that's like the minimum speed of these impacts. But then the maximum speed, you might think it's infinity. Things can be coming in as fast as they can possibly travel, but that's actually not the case. So the maximum speed of any object traveling within our solar system is actually 
only 72 kilometers per second, which sounds very fast, but it is an upper limit. And that upper limit comes from the gravitational pull of the sun. So it's exactly the same idea as the escape velocity for Earth, only it's the escape velocity for the sun. So if you took um, a spaceship or a planet or a comet or anything, it would need to move away from the sun at 72 kilometers per second to escape our solar system. So that kind of like 72 is the upper bound and 11 or 12 is the lower bound and impacts are going to occur at any speed in between those, but there's actually a pretty strong gradation so that the closer you are to the sun, the faster things travel. Um, on, so from my experience, I've done projects on Venus and Earth and out near Jupiter. So Venus's traditional like average impact velocity is about 25 kilometers per second. Here on Earth, it's only about 15. And then if you go even farther, so I, I've done some work out in Jupiter and Jupiter's impact velocities are only like 10 kilometers per second. Actually, no, that's not true. They're, they're a little bit higher. They're actually about 15 as well, but that's not just because of sun's gravitational acceleration, but also Jupiter. So there, you can kind of map out how the impact velocities will change based on the masses of the planets and the moons that are distributed throughout the solar system. That's a really long answer to say, on Earth, impacts usually occur at like 15 kilometers per second, which is 10, 10 miles per second. So very, very fast, but um, they're not all, not all speeds are possible. Uh, Patricia Donahue wants to know, if other planets and the moon will take the hit to protect us? And that is an excellent question. Um, there is some evidence that yes, that does actually occur. So the moon is really interesting because it is what we call tidally locked. So we always see the same face of the moon, no matter where it is orbiting the earth. And what this, what this has allowed is that convert like on the other side, the far side of the moon that we don't ever get to see is also always facing outward. And then if we look at the impacts that are on the side that we can see and the side that we can't, there are many, many, many more impacts on the side that we can't. Uh, this is not, I wouldn't say it's exactly a mystery of the moon because we do think that there is this effect where the far side of the moon is being hit more often than the near side um, because it is always facing outward. And in a sense, it would be protecting us. But the, the sense that we need the moon to have life, I think, is an ongoing question. Um, I don't want to get too much into the weeds, but as the solar system gets older, you're going to have less and less of these asteroids and meteorites flying around just because, you know, when the solar system starts, everything is kind of small particles and then they hit and they hit and they hit and they hit and you start to build up these asteroids, you start to build up these planets. And as you build up and combine all these materials, you have fewer small particles to continue hitting other things. So while there, you could make an argument that the moon absorbing all those impacts that would have otherwise hit Earth, that that could have an effect on whether or not like life could have evolved on Earth uh, given enough time. You can also say that as those impacts occur, you just have less material to continue hitting the Earth. So uh, there's like a flip side of that as well. It's not just a protection factor. It's also that there's less stuff flying around to cause damage. Um, okay, there is a question from Mary about whether iron impactors 
are attracted to iron deposits? And the answer to that would be no. Um, so when the asteroids come in, they are often made of iron and they are often uh, magnetic, which means you could take like a kitchen magnet and put it on a meteorite and the kind of iron that is in the meteorite will attract the magnet and you can like, feel it. But because the asteroids are coming in so fast, they're not going to have time to be like flying over the planet and then say, oh, there's a there's um an iron deposit over here, so I'm gonna go over there. They're just they're moving way too fast to respond to any of those kinds of um, forces. Conversely, um, Earth has a magnetic field that is generated from its interior deep in the inside of the Earth, and um, while the magnetic field of Earth deflects things like solar wind and kind of particles that are charged from far away. The asteroids and the meteorites that come in are also moving way too fast to be affected by the magnetic field. So I'm sure that that will cause some of the burning effect that I showed earlier with the with the crust of a meteorite, but it's not going to be enough to actually deflect things. Everything's just moving way too fast. Okay, there's a question about how oceans influence and impact. And this is a really interesting question. Um, this is an interesting question because, as I mentioned earlier, Earth is 70% covered by water right now. And um, so, if you have an impact coming in and it's just randomly going to strike somewhere on the surface, there's a 70% chance that it's going to hit water. And this is um, interesting because there are other geological factors, other things about Earth that make preserving impacts in an ocean more difficult. But um, I actually have done a little bit of modeling about this. And if you impact into water, it really drastically changes how the impact crater will form. So you're likely to generate a tsunami, which is a really huge wave away from the impact site, which then can affect the shorelines and any kind of forest or uh, like buildings that are along shorelines and beaches and things. But you're unlikely to actually form one of those really characteristic crater shapes that I showed earlier because what causes all those crater shapes is um, is that the oh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. What causes the crater shapes is that the rocks are deforming. So if you hit water of any depth, pretty much anything that's more than um, maybe like half a mile, quarter mile, then what ends up happening is the water will take all that shock wave. It'll it'll take all the pressures. It'll take all the temperatures, and it it will spread out. It will cause those tsunamis. But then by the time the rock underneath it gets affected, there's much less energy, and then it, it just it doesn't deform in the same way. So Evan, if you try refreshing the page, you might see some of the newer questions, or I can read them off to you. It's your choice. Um, I got them now. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, okay, there's a question from Ria's mom about what kind of crater is Chicxulub. Chicxulub is uh, the crater that is associated with killing the dinosaurs. Um, so 65 million years ago, there was a crater or an impact that hit <clears throat> outside of Mexico, uh, current Mexico. And Chicxulub, I think, has generally been called a peak ring crater. So large, but not planetary, like the whole size of the Earth large. But there is some compelling evidence that it actually is one of those multi-ring basins that I mentioned. And it's just um, because it would have hit, Chicxulub would have hit pretty much half on land, half in the Gulf of Mexico. So that would have also really changed how 
the crater forms, um, just because you have the water and then you've also got like a little bit of the land and um, in fact, or adding to that problem is that we also, it's currently underwater. So exploring it in a really concrete way is difficult, but there's been some new seismic studies. So they'll send out um, these boats to take like sound studies of the, the, the layers underneath the, the Gulf of Mexico. And I believe in those, in the last couple of years, They've been thinking that Chicxulub is actually a multi-ring basin. Um, it would be on the small side. So, like, when when does a peak ring crater start becoming a multi-ring basin? Those kinds of boundaries are arbitrary at this point. It's just how well are the rings that are associated with multi-ring basins formed? But there are so many factors that um, it can get muddy. I believe the current thinking is that Chicxulub is a multi-ring basin. And just it's much larger than we initially thought. Uh, Neil would like to know if asteroids ever bounce off Earth's atmosphere rather than enter it. That is an interesting question. I'm going to say no, because I think that. Asteroids coming in and meteorites coming in are coming so fast that that angle, um, this is probably coming from thinking about like Apollo 13, if anybody has seen the movie. The astronauts are trying to come back to Earth from their failed mission to the moon, and they've got a very narrow window in which to enter the atmosphere so that they don't completely burn up by going too steep towards the surface. But if then if they go too shallow, then they risk bouncing back off. And I think that the differences between asteroids and meteorites and a space capsule, there are many differences. Um, so the shape is going to play a big role. Asteroids and meteorites are kind of spherical, so they're not going to have a preferential direction to have the skimming effect. So they're not they're not going to have an orient like a a direction that they could be going that's less likely for them to come into the atmosphere, whereas a spaceship does because we're trying to protect astronauts coming back in. So there's these heat shields and a lot of engineering that goes into making that spacecraft a good shape to keep the astronauts safe. Also, the astronauts coming in are going a lot slower than a meteorite. So a meteorite, if it did, if it, if it was coming in such a direction that it might just bounce off, it would just burn and then kind of keep going. Um, but I don't think of it more, I don't think of it like a, as a bounce exactly. It's more just like cross cutting the atmosphere and then continuing on its way. Uh, have I traveled anywhere to look for meteorites? No, I haven't. <laughs> I would really like to. Um, I have sent in a few applications to go to Antarctica. So um, I don't think I mentioned this earlier. Antarctica and I think maybe Greenland are really good places to go look for meteorites because they have that really dark, distinctive color. And um, by going to places like Antarctica, you can go on the ice sheet, you can go in your snowmobile and kind of drive around. And if you see a really dark rock on the surface, then you can be pretty confident that it's actually an asteroid or a meteorite. Um, so I've applied to go to Antarctica, but uh, because I took some time off to go work in the oil industry, I kind of am not an ideal candidate anymore, but I'm gonna get back into it. And hopefully one day I can, I can go look for meteorites like my friends. <laughs> um, what type of crater is most common on Earth? That is a really good question, and I don't actually know what kind of crater is the most common. Um, so on Earth, the impact cratering record, so like the, the craters that we know of, is really not representative of the history of Earth as a whole. And that is because uh, we have our oceans, 
and the crust underneath our oceans, which would have to be what preserves the, the impact craters in the rock record, that crust is actually really, really young compared to the age of the whole Earth as a system because we're constantly generating new crust at those mid-ocean ridges. Um, and then we're, we're killing it, we're destroying the crust at the subduction zones. So Earth has this really active system where it's churning out new crust over 70% of the surface at a pretty high rate. And because of that, we don't have hardly any impact craters preserved in ocean basins, but that's so much of the surface. Um, so there are some craters that are preserved on the continents. There's meteor crater, like I showed earlier. There are some structures in Canada and South Africa and Europe. Um, but all told, there are only about 200 craters that are on Earth. And I would say probably the most common, that's a really good question. Um, Probably, if I had to guess, I would I would guess complex crater, because it would have to be big enough to be recognizable, and also be able to be uh, preserved. So I didn't I didn't really get into this, but there are a couple different techniques that scientists can use to see if there's an impact crater in a, in an area, and you can look at the shapes. So you can go to a place like Meteor Crater. And you can say, oh, holy moly, this is a big hole in the ground. I bet this is a crater. But for the older ones, you need to use other techniques just because that crater could be filled in with other rocks or it could be really windy and a lot of water that would destroy any kind of that, that really uh, characteristic shape that you would want to see. So we can also use um, these features called shock metamorphic features. And shock metamorphic features happen right at that point of impact because the, the two rocks hitting are so fast and so strong that when they collide, you generate this really strong pressure wave. It's just like if you're playing billiards, you're playing pool and you hit the cue ball into one of the other balls and you get that noise. When that happens, you're also generating pressure wave, but it's just a much smaller scale. So, for an impact crater, you generate that, that shock wave right at this point of impact, and it's so high, there's such high pressures and such high temperatures that you will fundamentally change what the rock is made of. And because impact craters are such a, a distinct event and they're, they're so quick in terms of geologic timescale, the features that that shock wave will generate are really diagnostic. So you can you can take a rock into the lab and you can put it under a microscope. And if you see these certain like planar features and you can figure out how they're oriented when you actually pick the rock up from the ground, and you can say there was a crater here, even though if you looked at the topography, if you looked at the landscape, you wouldn't be able to see anything that would look like a crater at the time. I think we have time for one more quick answer because we're almost just about out of time. Okay. Um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I guess there's a question about why I decided to become a geologist. That's pretty quick. Um, I really enjoy being outside. And I was able to take geology in high school. That was a whole, whole big story of my life. And um, I just really fell in love with it and how hands-on geology is. I think especially for kids, we kind of all run around picking up rocks and looking at rocks and collecting rocks and telling our parents about rocks. And um, when I kind of put together first in high school and then when I went to Rutgers um, looking for a major, I was like, wow, I can like pick up rocks for a living, as silly as that sounds. Um, and it's just, it's been such a good way for me to, to be able to get outside and to, to better understand like, I live in the Northeast, so like, why are the Appalachian Mountains here? Why does the coastline look the way that it does? Why, why does New Jersey have three distinct kind of local geologies? All those kinds of questions you can start to answer if you can understand the geology and understand the rocks that are around you. And then 
focusing on the impact cratering specifically, that's been a really great way for me to use my interest in physics and math to also um, apply it to the rocks that I that I've loved so much throughout my life. I highly recommend geology as a field for any any kids out there, for sure. Great, thank you. This is very interesting. I learned a whole lot about <laughs> impacts <laughs> and cratering and things like that. So thank you, Evan. This was great, um, and thank you everyone for attending. Um, our next Ask a Geologist will be this Thursday um, at 11 a.m. Uh, and it will also continue our planetary theme. Uh, Dr. Julianne Gross will be talking about the moon. Uh, she is currently the deputy director of the Apollo uh, collection at NASA. So she'll be talking about some of the things that we know or don't know about the moon. So thank you everyone and we will see you on Thursday.